Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Streamline Your SARS-CoV-2 Antibody Testing with an SVNT NAV Solution. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak about your offense and allow us to showcase our ability to support your drug and vaccine development needs. Our presenters today are Ashley Brandt, our Senior Scientific Director with Eurofins Bioanalytical Services, and Sean Taylor, Field Application Scientist with GenScript. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane and your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Eurofins was established in 1987 and it's comprised of three key divisions, environmental food and biopharmaceutical testing services. Our motto is testing for life and it focuses on looking after our well-being through the food that we eat, environment we live in, and the pharmaceutical products that we take. Eurofins recently won the 2021 CRO Leadership Award from Life Science Leader and ISR in all five categories, compatibility, capabilities, reliability, expertise, and quality while taking a client-centric approach to the studies that we support. We're unparalleled in its portfolio of testing and its innovative technology and its global network of laboratories to meet the needs of the industries that we serve. Eurofins Biopharma Services provides seamless end-to-end -end drug testing solutions to help clients progress through the drug development cycle through a single experienced provider utilizing a global network of laboratories under the Eurofins umbrella. Key drug development services that we provide are drug discovery, cell line development, drug substance, drug product testing, logistical support for multi-site, multi-country clinical studies. Here are Eurofin Central Lab services and over 15 years of industry leading global expertise with bioanalytical services, supporting clinical trials with PKTK, ADA, NAV, biomarker assays and sample analysis. Our network of laboratories can work as a cohesive all-in-one service or through an a la carte approach based on our clients' needs. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Sean Taylor, Field Application Scientist with GenScript. So hello, everyone. So um, this talk, uh, I'll be contrasting the pre-existing um, total IgG binding antibody assays with a high throughput functional and protective neutralizing antibody test uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 post-vaccination era. I'll be, the learning objectives today will be understanding the principles of this new surrogate virus neutralization test and how it compares to the gold standard live virus neutralization tests such as PRNT or foci-reducing neutralizing tests. We'll also contrast the more traditional and commonly employed SARS-CoV-2 Ig binding antibody assays with CPAS and discuss the variation in efficacy of the current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines after one or two doses and uncertainties in vaccinated populations concerning protection. And finally, learn about how CPAS can distinguish between Ig binding antibody tests in delineating between vaccinated individuals and how these data compare to the published efficacy data for the vaccines themselves. So if we look at timing for molecular tests post-infection, and we go to this chart here at the bottom, it's important to understand that when a person is infected by SARS-CoV-2, that the initial response uh, that can be measured, the biomolecules that can be measured are the viral RNA from the virus itself. So we're, and that, that's why the testing that was done during the pandemic itself was predominantly qPCR or molecular testing, because we want to assess whether people are infected and then to know if they should be quarantined. And, and so the virus persists and can be measured in terms of its viral RNA very early uh, post-symptom onset, uh, 
And then as our immune system reacts to the virus and then clears the virus, then we are able to start to measure immunoglobulins associated with viral infection. So these immunoglobulins are measured later, typically a week or so, maybe 10 days post symptom onset. And then the viral RNA is measured very early within days of symptom onset. So we can assess quickly. So if we look at the antibodies themselves, there are a variety of different antibody responses to viral infection. And um, what we, the, the key antibodies that help with protection of, from infection are called neutralizing antibodies. So when we have an antibody, an immune response to viral infection, we, can, we typically have a broad range of antibodies that can bind to the virus. And this cartoon shows the virus here with the spike glycoprotein. And we can have a lot of antibodies that bind to various proteins that are associated with the virus. But there are specific subclass of these antibodies that are called neutralizing antibodies that bind in such a way to the virus, as we see here, that the virus can no longer bind to the host cell receptor. And in this case, it's, it's been quite clearly identified that the ACE2 receptor is one of the key receptors that SARS-CoV-2 binds to, to enable the virus to inject its RNA into the cell and then replicate itself. So if we generate a productive immune response to the virus, then we generate these neutralizing antibodies which block the virus from being able to bind to the ACE2 receptor, in effect neutralizing the, the ability of the virus to replicate. So these antibodies are really critical. So there are a variety of tests for specifically for neutralizing antibodies. And one of the key tests, one of the tests that's been traditionally done uh, for, for many years is called the virus neutralization test. This test uses live virus. So, so in this test, it's a dangerous test because it uses live SARS-CoV-2 virus and requires therefore a level three containment facility with uh, special protective equipment and highly trained uh, technicians to conduct this test. And in this test, the live virus is incubated with uh, a sample that contains the antibodies. So this would be a, a serum or plasma from someone who was infected and recovered from infection from SARS-CoV-2. And if that sample contains neutralizing antibodies, as we see here, they'll bind to the virus and block it from binding to cells that are transfected with the ACE2 receptor. If we don't, if we have neutralizing antibodies and the virus can't bind, we get no signal or a low signal response. On the opposing side, if we have patient samples that don't have neutralizing antibodies up here in this part of the diagram, then we see that the virus can bind to the ACE2 receptor and we will measure a signal from this test. So it's a very straightforward test and it's really based on whether or not the sample that we've been incubating the virus with contains neutralizing antibodies or does not contain neutralizing antibodies. Now, it's a very elegant test, works very well, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, it requires highly trained uh, people, uh, level three BCL containment facility. It's very tedious to run this assay and it takes a long time. It's two to four days typically to get a result from this kind of test. So a low throughput test as well. The next level of testing for, for neutralizing antibodies is called the pseudovirus test, which is identical to the virus test. The only difference between the pseudovirus test and the virus test is that instead of using live SARS-CoV-2 virus, we're using a lentivirus typically that's transfected with just the spike protein, which is what's important to get the virus to bind to cells to the ACE2 receptor. So it's an innocuous virus, and therefore that means it's safer 
we don't need a BCL3 lab, a BSL3 lab, we only need a BSL2 lab. So we don't need as much protective equipment and as much lab training and uh, complex uh, filtering systems to conduct this test, but it's the same test. So we incubate the virus with the patient sample and we either get a signal or we, or we don't get a signal based on whether or not the sample has neutralizing antibodies. So it still takes a long time to conduct this test and it's still very low throughput. It's really not amenable to mass population testing, either of these viral VNT tests or PVNT tests. So Dr. Lin Fa Wang um, thought about this concept of the virus binding and thought, what if we take just the protein components of this interaction between the virus and the ACE2 receptor to make a much more amenable test to high throughput analysis. And that's what we did here. So that's, that's where this kit, the CPAS SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody test actually evolved. So it started by purifying the, just the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the protein component, so the receptor binding domain, and the extracellular domain of the ACE2 receptor from host cells. So we have the extracellular domain of ACE2, the receptor binding domain from the virus, and these are the two components that strongly interact with each other. This is how the virus docks to cells, by these two protein components. And we coated plates with the ACE2 receptor, as we see here. And then by co-incubating the sample, the patient serum sample that contains antibodies, with the receptor binding domain, we'll either get neutralizing antibodies binding, which are in red here, as we see, or non-neutralizing antibodies, because again, we have a total immune response, so you can have both types of antibodies in an immune response that can bind as well to the receptor binding domain. And, but if we do have neutralizing antibodies that bind, then the receptor binding domain can't bind, it's being blocked from binding to the ACE2 receptor, and we'll get no signal in this assay. Alternatively, if all we have are non-neutralizing antibodies, which you see here in blue, then the receptor binding domain will bind to the ACE2 receptor, and we'll get a signal in this assay because in, our, in, in this test, we've conjugated horseradish peroxidase to the receptor binding domain, which will elicit a signal when incubated with the uh, colorimetric substrate TMB. So just to, just to show the assay in, in, uh, in, more pictorial, uh, in a more pictorial way, what we have here is uh, an initial mixing of the RBD, receptor binding domain conjugated to HRP with patient samples, which can contain neutralizing or non-neutralizing antibodies. <clears throat> and after mixing the, uh, the antibodies, the serum, with the RBD HRP, we then add this to the assay plate itself. So this incubation is about 30 minutes at 37 degrees to get this binding event to happen. Then we transfer this mixture to the assay plate and any RBD HRP complexes that are not bound to neutralizing antibodies, so in blue this is a non-neutralizing antibody, they'll make their way to the ACE2 receptor. The other molecules can't because they're blocked by these neutralizing antibodies depicted here in red. So when we wash the plate, we'll wash away these molecules but this one molecule will remain bound because it's a very strong interaction. Then when we add TMB, we get a light yellow color because only one molecule is bound to the ACE2 receptor. If the individual has no neutralizing antibodies, then when we mix the sample with the RBD HRP, we'll certainly get binding of non-neutralizing antibodies but all of these RBD HRP complexes can then bind to the ACE2 receptor because there's no neutralizing antibodies bound here. And then when we wash the plate, they'll all remain bound. So when we add TMB, we get a much darker yellow color. So the darker the color 
the more intense the color at the end, the more the less neutralizing antibodies are in the sample. The lighter the color, the more neutralizing antibodies. So what are the advantages of this test? So the advantages are, are threefold, actually. First, the first advantage is that this test is immunoglobulin agnostic. So if neutralizing antibodies come from either IgGs, IgAs, IgMs, regardless of the subclass of immunoglobulins, so long as those neutralizing antibodies bind to RBD, which is the most immunogenic portion of the spike protein. So the, the likelihood of, of neutralizing antibodies binding to RBD is very high. It doesn't matter what immuno, immuno class of um, what class of immunoglobulins these these neutralizing antibodies are made in, they can bind to RBD. So this test permits a total neutralizing antibody picture in terms of does this individual have neutralizing antibodies or not. So it increases the sensitivity of this assay versus other tests that are limited to only detecting either IgGs, IgMs, or IgAs with secondary antibodies. We're using RBD as the bait protein for the antibodies. We're not using a specific secondary antibody that's very specific to one class of immunoglobulins that might miss neutralizing antibodies that are derived from other classes. So that increases the sensitivity of the assay. Another advantage is that the RBD is in solution. It's not coated on the surface of the plate. And in, in other ELISA tests that are not looking at neutralizing antibodies, just looking at total immune response, often those tests use RBD coated on the surface of the plate or spike protein or nucleocapsid protein. And when we code proteins to the surface of plates, those proteins can often change in their conformation and especially when it's the bait protein that, that we're using to bind antibodies, if we, if, we miss, if we lose the conformation, the native structure of the protein by coding it, then it can, it can present other antigenic sites that would not normally be in the native protein that might non-specifically bind other immunoglobulins unrelated to SARS-CoV-2, leading to lower specificity, more false positives. In this assay, it's an, it's the RBD is in solution. It's in it's in a near native conformation that forces the antibodies to bind to the near native antigenic sites that would normally be presented in a true in vivo situation. So we increase the specificity this way by having the RBD in solution. And of course, the third advantage to this test is that we are truly measuring function. So we're measuring the antibodies that truly block the ability of RBD to dock to the ACE2 receptor. So these are the protective antibodies that we need to assure that the virus can't bind to the cell surface and replicate. So that's what this, that's what this assay is measuring. It's a functional test. So um, just, just to compare, so we, we did do some comparisons very early on, and this was, uh, this was a, a study by Inatos Laboratories um, very early on where they looked at a number of different just regular antibody assays, serology tests that are out there that just look at binding antibodies. So these are the, these are the assays that have coated plates with the bait protein like RBD coated plates or or nucleocapsid coated plates, or spike protein coated plates. And these are all these different assays here. And they compared 84 negative samples with 10 positive samples with the GenScript CPAS test. And what we saw that, what, that was that the sensitivity and specificity of these various assays varied quite significantly from assay to assay, whereas we got very good 100% specificity and, and sensitivity with the CPAS test. And we attribute this to the nature of the way the test is, is, is put together with RBD in solution, opposed to it being coated on the surface of the plate, and also the fact that it's binding, neutralizing antibodies from all the different immunoclasses to increase the sensitivity. 
Of course, if you look at the uh, the positive and negative predictive values and accuracies, those those are relative to sensitivity and specificity. So of course, those also changed quite a bit from assay to assay, and we got um, a perfect score here with the GenScript test. Now, of course, when I saw these data, being a scientist myself, I was uh, a little bit skeptical at seeing perfect, perfect data here. So um, we went ahead and did our own uh, study with collaborating groups from across North America um, in a study that we did with Health Canada, uh, the University of Colorado, and Cayman Chemical Company where we supplied kits to these organizations and they used their own samples with our with CPAS and compared them with other binding antibody tests in their own labs. And the data, the data came back here, and this is published actually in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. Uh, you can look up uh, under Taylor et al. Journal of Clinical Microbiology, and you'll be able to find that. It was just published a couple weeks ago, actually. So here we have um, three IgG tests. This was the University of Colorado data from study one, where we looked at RBD coated plate, spike S1 coated plate, and nucleocapsid coated commercial plates. These are all commercial assays that we've purchased. And we looked at 45 presumed positive samples and 23 presumed negative samples versus the CPAS test. So this is our, nu our um, neutralizing antibody assay. And what we saw, if we look on the right side of each of these graphs for the positive sam for the um, for the negative samples, so squares are, are the negative samples. We saw that the RBD coated plates gave three false positives out of the 23 presumed negative samples. And when I say presumed negative, these samples were in fact pre-pandemic samples, so they should be negative. So we got 23 false positives here with RBD coated. With the nucleocapsid coated plate, we got one false positive out of the 23 samples. And coincidentally, with the spike coated plate, all the samples were called negative. So that was, that was, that was a nice result with the spike S1 coated plate. And of course, with the uh, SVNT, with our neutralizing antibody test, all the 23 samples were called negative. If we go to the positive samples, what we saw, and these presumed positive samples were presumed positive by qPCR, um, and there are qPCR has its own issues with uh, with calling samples positive or negative. But so let's take that um, at hand when we look at these data. The RBD coded plate called 43 of the 45 samples positive, but it also called a lot of the negative samples positive. So these data are are definitely in question here. If we go to the spike S1 and nucleocapsid coated plate, which actually, which actually called less of the negative samples positive or none, in the case of the spike S1 coated plate, there were a lot of false negatives actually. 11 of the, of the 45 samples were called negative here. Only 34 were, call, were called positive. And for the nucleocapsid coated plate, uh, it was even worse. 17 samples were called falsely negative. Only 28 of the 45 were called positive. Whereas with the CPAS test, six of the samples were called negative and 39 were called positive. So we were very pleased, obviously, with these results. But we, but we were curious about these six false negative samples. And they're depicted here in red. And we went back and looked at the other two assays. And we noticed that actually the same six samples in red were called negative in the spike coated plates and the nucleocapsid coated plates. So it's, we concluded that there at least is, co is corroborating data between these assays that might indicate that these six samples were in fact truly negative and perhaps called falsely positive by qPCR. And uh, in the article, uh, you'll see that we refer to some, to some papers that question the, um, the level of the threshold that's set in qPCR. It's very high in a lot of the qPCR tests where uh, to delineate between negative and positive samples. Uh, some of these tests have, have cycle thresholds of even 40 to delineate between negative and positive samples, and, and a cycle threshold of 40 is extremely high. It's way beyond the limit of quantification or detection of, of a qPCR test. So if we go to study two, which was Health Canada, 
um, in this in this study, what we saw, what we what we were lucky enough was the samples were very nicely delineated between days post symptom onset, and we were able to look at samples um, that were five to nine days post symptom onset. This was after natural infection recovery. Ten to nineteen days, greater than nineteen days, and then of course all the time points together. And I'm I'm not going to go through all these data. I really just want to look at the sensitivity. Uh, of, the, of, of all of these different IgG binding assays. So these are, again, these are different binding antibody tests where the bait protein is coated either to the surface of a plate or maybe on a bead versus the GenScript new, uh, neutralization assay. And what we found was that the neutralization test was quite good, 86% versus uh, these other tests. Some of them were were at 100% sensitivity, so they got all the all the samples correct. Again, very small sample set though, but but still but relatively good data. When we moved to the 10 to 19 days, the GenScript actually had the the best results in terms of sensitivity, and again, right at the top of the heap uh, for um, uh, for for the nine, for greater than 19 days. In fact, all the tests were 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 quite uh, were, were excellent at greater than 19 days post symptom onset. And if you look at all the time points together, the the GenScript test was right at the top of the pile of all of these other tests. And again, this is attributed to just the way this test is done um, and and put together uh, in terms of having RBD in solution and the fact that RBD can bind all uh, all um, the classes of immunoglobulins. We also looked at 50, approximately 50 negative samples, and again, the GenScript test gave 100% specificity. So these two studies together that I just showed you are really just to, to support the fact that although this test measures specifically neutralizing antibodies, for natural infection and recovery, it's as good, if not better, in terms of sensitivity and specificity as other just binding antibody tests that are out there on the market currently that people are using. But it gives the added advantage of knowing for sure that the samples have neutralizing antibodies. So there's really no reason not to use this test it, for screening purposes for natural infection and recovery, because it just gives you more useful uh, and and uh, and more in-depth information about the function of the antibodies uh, that are involved in in the uh, in the assay, as well as uh, good sensitivity and specificity. We also compared the uh, this assay to live cell testing. So and the gold standard is is print uh, PRNT plaque reducing neutralizing test. Uh, this is what's done uh, exclusively in many labs. And we compared the CPAS test with PRNT for 66 samples, where the CPAS delineated 40 of the samples negative and 26 of them positive. And in PRNT, there are different stringencies that you can set for PRNT, and it's generally uh, it's generally accepted that the higher stringencies should be used when looking at at these kinds of live cell tests, PRNT 75 and 90, because when you go down to uh, a, a PRNT50, which is where you're only looking at 50% of plaques being reduced, um, you typically get a lot of false positives with, uh, with, with, uh, with this level of analysis. But versus the higher stringency, we called 39 positive and 20, uh, sorry, 39 negative and 27 positive at a PRNT90 or 75 versus 40 negative and 26 positive. So almost a perfect correlation between uh, the CPAS test and live cell testing. Uh, as we see, when we went to PRNT50, a couple of the samples uh, moved to uh, positive from negative, and that's what is expected when you lose a, use a lower analysis stringency. We also looked uh, at uh, an FRNT test, which is another live cell test, foci reducing neutralizing test, and this is just a cautionary note, and I've seen even these kind of results with PRNT tests. Not all PRNT tests are the same. It really depends on the cells, the virus, the rigor in which the tests are done, the technicians involved, and so on, these live cell assays. And in this particular test, you can see that there's a dramatic difference between an FRNT50, an FRNT75, and an FRNT90, where 
most of the samples are positive at a 50% um, stringency, and many of the samples, literally it's half and half, are negative or positive at a, at a 90 level. So it's very challenging to know, okay, so if I use, what stringency should I use to get a true reflection on whether or not these samples are positive or negative with a live cell test? The CPATH test uh, is, is, is quite conclusive. And these samples, these 45 samples that were used in these two tests were in fact the identical samples that we used to compare the data in study one here where we, where, where we got a very nice uh, correlation in terms of the negative samples with these other tests. So we actually uh, suggest that, that CPAS could be used as a way to calibrate these live cell assays to get a true reflection on the negative and positive samples uh, between um, in, in, uh, in studies. Um, not to believe us, because this was all data that we generated in collaboration with these groups, um, but there are other nice studies published, and this one in Journal of Clinical Microbiology by, by, some, other, uh, by, by some other groups, uh, completely unrelated to, uh, to GenScript uh, at all, that looked at PRNT90 versus our neutralizing test, and in, uh, they looked at a number of different samples. The, another advantage of this assay is that you can actually uh, look at different uh, species as well. This is a species-independent test as well. They looked at 401 human samples, 44 dogs, 61 cats, five hamsters, and I think they looked at a partridge in a pear tree, but they didn't include the partridge in this test. So, um, and what they saw was almost 99% correlation of sensitivity and specificity between SVNT, our test, neutralizing test, and live cell testing. So very nice data that correlates uh, between live cell testing. Um, because we're in a post-vaccine data, I'm going to switch over to vaccination now. Um, many people want to know what their levels of titers are of neutralizing antibodies now after they've been vaccinated either with one dose of vaccine or after two doses and even over time after the second dose there's a lot of questions out there how long am i protected for post vaccination so we uh, are this assay our SVNT test has been EUA authorized for qualitative analysis and that's to delineate between uh, negative and positive samples based on a cutoff of 30% neutralization. So that's already been authorized, but we've submitted um, uh, our, our, um, our um, authorization for, um, we've submitted to, to have authorization for, um, I'm just trying to switch slides here. Trying to switch. Just give me a second. I'm just trying to switch my slide. There we go. So we've submitted to have authorization for a semi-quantitative version of the CPAS test, of our neutralizing antibody test. It's the same test. It's just the way in which the test is run, which would now incorporate a standard curve from a standard uh, monoclonal antibody cocktail that will that, that you would purchase in addition to the kit to generate a standard curve and then the individual samples from uh, patients can be plotted based on the standard curve to get a neutralizing antibody titer so that way we can get a titer and by multiplying the titer from the standard curve by the dilution factor of the sample to be in the linear range of the standard curve. Obviously, uh, if you have a very high neutralizing antibody uh, level, you'd need to dilute your sample to get within the linear range of the standard curve, and then you plot on the standard curve and multiply by the dilution factor to get a final neutralizing antibody titer. So this has been submitted for EUA authorization. The, uh, the FDA has actually been asking us for this, so we're hoping that this will be uh, approved quite quickly, and then this assay will be both for qualitative and semi-quantitative analysis of neutralizing antibody titers. So this is coming very soon. 
We did look at 25 infected recovered individuals based on our semi-quantitative test. We looked at first the, the data by a one in 10 dilution factor, which is using our qualitative test. So qualitatively, we recommend diluting all samples by one in 10, and then you run them in our test to get a percent neutralization. And you can see we had we ranked the, the uh, samples by percent neutralization from 31, which is just above our cutoff, all the way up to 95. And these were randomly selected samples uh, from, uh, from 100 samples that, 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 that we had tested. And then we looked at their titers based on standard curve. And you can see that although the percent neutralization difference is only about threefold here, the difference in titer can range all the way up to 600-fold. Large differences from 148 nanograms per mil of neutralizing antibodies all the way up to 90,000, which is a 600-fold difference between this individual and this individual. And all these samples were taken from these patients at least three to four weeks post-infection. So their neutralizing antibody level should have been more or less at maximum. All this data shows is that there's a huge variation in the level of neutralizing antibodies that individuals can have after they've been infected and recovered from SARS-CoV-2. And we expect that this would probably be similar after vaccination, because it's the same thing. You're vaccinated, you're generating an, an antibody response to vaccination, and those neutralizing antibodies could vary dramatically from individual to individual. So this permits now one to know what level of neutralizing antibodies they have and to crack the level over time with, with testing over months or, or over a year. So um, we're in the wild west of vaccines now. I like to use this term because we now have a number of different vaccines that are on the market from different manufacturers. And this, uh, so this JAMA paper is nice because they have, it's a very short article. It only has one table which summarizes all the vaccines that are out there. And this is the table. It's very busy, so I'm not going to, uh, I don't want you to go through and look at all these information, but it's nice to, to have this. It's just nice that it's all in one place. Um, I really just want to direct you to the efficacy of these various vaccines. So we have Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, which are the ones that are currently approved in the U.S. right now. And if you look at the efficacy of the vaccines, um, the, the, the overall efficacy is quite different between these vaccines, even between uh, one dose and two doses. So, so, of course, the Moderna vaccine is, is in the 90s after both doses. But... If we look at the Pfizer vaccine, it's only 52% after the first dose, goes up to 94 after the, after the second dose. And Johnson & Johnson, uh, remember, Johnson & Johnson got approved after the variants were predominantly out there, the UK and South African variants. So they actually have a delineation between their efficacy between those variants, which ranges from 57 up to 72 so there are large differences, and we don't know how these other vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, they never looked at variants in their, in their assays. So we don't know how much lower efficacy is in the presence of variants, but there's a wide range in, uh, in vaccine efficacy. And that begs the question then, if I have a wide range in vaccine, in vaccine efficacy, I will probably want to know after I've been vaccinated if in fact I am protected, right? I don't want to fall into the 28% of people that, that received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and not being protected from vaccination. So that begs the question about getting a neutralizing antibody test post-vaccination just to ensure that in fact I am protected post-vaccination. And then of course, how long after I've been vaccinated am I protected? So uh, this is, again, some real-world data. So this table is really just manufacturer claims, and I'm sure based on data from the manufacturers. Here's a study from, uh, from the, um, uh, the Mayo Clinic where they looked at the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines kind of combined together, but it really shows, again, if we look at the efficacy, the results are, are uh, for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine at days post-vaccination are quite dramatically uh, changing and different as we go through these results. And, and again, you know, we, if it's this low 
um, after vaccination, um, especially after one or two doses, it begs the question, do I, should I get some sort of confirmation test so that I know that I'm protected post-vaccination? I know I'm generating the antibodies, especially neutralizing antibodies, post-vaccination. So these are data from the Mayo Clinic, and, this is, and there are other data from Israel and the UK as well that corroborate these data. So what we did um, was we looked at CPAS uh, in comparison to two IgG binding antibody tests. So we looked at um, the Abbott uh, test and the Diasorin test, which are, which are quantitative IgG binding tests that use either the spike protein or RBD. And we looked at the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines at baseline two weeks and just before the second dose of vaccine. And we compared them with CPAS. So the light blue and middle blue are the two IgG tests. And this is the neutralizing antibody test. And really what I want to show you here is that even two weeks after um, vaccination, there's a significant difference in the amount of neutralizing antibodies. So only 77% of people had neutralizing antibodies versus a total immune response. So just because you have an IgG response to vaccination, doesn't necessarily mean that you have the, the, the functional neutralizing antibodies that protect you from vaccination. And, that, and that, this difference was observed all across the board with both vaccines. Uh, uh, and what was interesting was when we compared the neutralizing antibody results to the actual published data and data that's been published in larger studies on true vaccine efficacy, these results corroborated those studies quite well, as opposed to these IgG tests, which did not. So just because you've been vaccinated and you have an immune response doesn't mean you're, you're generating the correct immune response. So that concludes my part of, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this presentation, and I'll pass the baton over to, uh, to Ashley now. Thanks so much, Sean. Let me see if I can take control. Maybe. Here we go. So we saw the potential with this type of assay um, early on and started to um, talk to GenScript about bringing this assay in to the Eurofins uh, Bioanalytical Services Laboratory um, as a standing assay that we would go ahead and not only qualify but validate to good clinical practices um, for use uh, for all of our clients really for their clinical trials to show again both you know during their clinical trials do their for you know whether it's a treatment or a vaccine um, to provide this neutralizing antibody response to COVID-19 um, as well as moving forward in a post-vaccination world um, do the clinical trial subjects have true protection and how will the clinical trial managers try to manage essentially that risk in their clinical trial? Because obviously no one wants to have an impact from a COVID-19 infection to therefore muddy the waters for your clinical trial results. Um, and as a clinical trial subject, especially as you go into phase two and phase three, A, you're gonna have visits that you know, typically are going to take them into a medical setting with a risk of infection if they aren't protected. But then additionally, they're going to want to be out in the community. And if there is community spread, which we currently have active, um, then there is that risk. So we assessed um, the SVNT assay in a full validation as we would um, any method um, for neutralizing antibodies. So we assessed the selectivity and specificity um, of the method, we assess the precision, and we assess the sensitivity. So the difference for this one that we were evaluating um, was just, again, to try and evaluate um, what this would provide for our clients. So neutralizing antibody characterization from um, 
the animal models and then through human clinical trials. So therefore, if we're assessing things in an initial um, toxicology or PK, pharmacokinetic um, study that's being done in a preclinical model, uh, either as, um, oh, losing my audio, um, either as a, And again, I'm using my, losing my audio. Sorry about that, guys. So whether or not we're in a um, preclinical model or in a, a clinical model, we'll be able to cover this and run this test for either. So here you can see um, data um, with dilution ratios where we can show um, patients over time that as we as that signal is diluted out, we're still continuing to be able to um, essentially provide that semi-quantitative response. Um, regardless, again, of whether or not you are in uh, human or not, and then how the method is performing so that you can see more real-time vaccine efficacy or you can see therapeutic drug um, efficacy over time. So we evaluated the selectivity and the specificity, again, um, in our own naive lots, um, and then we spiked that in at a 1,500 nanogram per mil um, level, which was considered our low PC or low positive control. So as you can see, our serum pools, as well as all 20 lots that we assessed, um, we did assess some of these lots with lipemic um, effects, as well as um, with um, high levels of red blood cells just again so that we can mimic any of those sample collection issues that may come up um, and we found that we still had a high level of selectivity all 100 percent of these 20 lots all came up um, above cut point so therefore you know completely clean and then you can see is that signal um, drops um, when once we spike it and again we saw you know very little uh, change whether or not it was in a different um, patient or whether or not we put in um, you know it in lipemic or um, samples or anything else so we saw very little inter interactions with other things um, so then we did a sensitivity assessment so um, for our sensitivity, we perform this a little differently than say a kit manufacturer. So from their perspective, they're looking to see the sensitivity essentially on plate or in tube, where we're looking at it as a sensitivity from the sample itself. So we spiked um, levels um, within the serum and then diluted that out in our negative base pool serum. So our, our pooled serum that we had screened to make sure obviously that there weren't any neutralizing antibodies in there um, and evaluated that um, across here. And you can see that um, in each of our curves, we got very consistent data. So again, it just goes to show you um, how solid we saw this method perform in our hands um, as we moved through and really felt more and more confident as we assessed each of these different parameters. Um, so then we went go into the precision. Um, so we ran this in six assays um, across two different analysts over at least two days, and I think it ended up being actually three. Um, and look to see what you know the variability would be using the inter and intra assay statistics. So in looking at that, you can see that the greatest amount of variability we saw was here um, in our low positive control, and it was in run four, and here we're at 20.1% CV. Um, but then if you balance that all out, um, you see that overall, um, we have a 12.4% CV across all those six runs for the low positive control. Um, it's even better for our high positive control um, at 4.3%. And then it, our negative control, um, we're at 8.5%. So again, across all of these different preparations, um, six different runs, two different people doing it, um, at least over several days, we still saw really tight, precise overall performance, even when we're at this um, low positive control area, um, which is right at that threshold. Ooh. Sorry about that. Um, so this is just uh, 
scatter plot showing how our high quality controls or high positive controls in this case um, performed just to show you essentially how all of the runs even more so than just the the precision runs. This is all the runs that we've ever performed with this assay, um, including, uh, you know, just for um, this particular sake of some of the runs that maybe didn't perform either because of an analyst error. So there are some failures as well, just to again show that overall how it still performs. So we showed how the assay controls um, continue to run across all of our runs. And at Eurofins, we track this data actually um, per method. So even as we have continued to run this method, we'll continue to add more data to this and track and trend the positive controls and how they perform. So that if, for instance, we got a new lot um, and qualified it, but somehow the signal was ever so slightly, you know, at the lower end of what we would consider our acceptance criteria, we would we would assess that and then be able to either shift the ranges or go back and contact GenScript and say, hey, we're seeing something that's slightly different. You know, what do you suggest that we do? So we've had lots of those conversations, you know, as we've developed this. Um, we haven't come across anything that's really been of concern thus far and brought in additional lots. Um, but as you can see from the data, you know, as you track and trend across for the the passing runs, everything looks very consistent. Um, we've identified the green ones, those are at the front of the plate versus our back of the plate um, ones. And again, those are pretty consistent. We're not seeing you know, any edge effects or anything from the front versus the back. Um, and again, those get uh, pipetted out with the samples. So therefore, there's not a difference for samples that were pipetted in the beginning of the run versus at the end. Um, so it really just adds that confidence that this assay performs and was, is within a validated state throughout its life cycle. Um, and as we get more and more samples in to assess this, um, this method, it will just help us to provide even more confidence in how it performs in our laboratory. So just talking a little bit about um, you know the Eurofins advantage and us running this. So we are a preferred partner to to run this method. Um, we have gone ahead and validated it within our shop. Um, we do have it also um, qualified to run on our TCANs so that we can run uh, high throughput samples through this um, and have dedicated QC and QA um, group that have gone through this data and um, understand the method. Um, we've tried to create it very scalable so that we can run the, the single plate of samples as they come in um, and provide either the fast turnaround time. Um, if you're looking for something, for instance, to pre-qualify patients to enroll in your study, um, or if you're looking for something where you're wanting to screen many, many patients um, at the end of your study to see whether or not they had protection throughout. Um, we do have a global footprint um, and we have, we have the Eurofin Central Lab also to provide central laboratory services so that you can have your samples uh, properly kitted and labeled and everything's all set for that. So we wanted to give a comparison uh, between uh, the kit protocols. So we have here um, essentially um, the TCAN EVO, which is what we're using in our laboratory in order to um, both do the dilutions if we're doing the semi-quantitative method, which we've, uh, again, we validated both. So we have actually gone through and done a GCP um, analysis of that semi-quantitative version that Sean was discussing. So we have that protocol as well as just doing the qualified um, whether or not you have essentially a positive or negative sample as well. So we can either titer out those samples for you or we can run it as just a um, whether or not they're present and they've met the threshold or not. So if we're using this and looking at the OD50s we're just letting you know essentially what this um, data would look like, um, either between 10 repeats, nine repeats, um, and how tight the data is. So whether or not we're running this um, particular sample, um, you know, across just, you know, once or we're running it across multiple plates, we're going to get the same results regardless. So the kit is approved. Um, by the US FDA um, in that qualitative, um, the quantitative has been submitted. Um, we've been utilizing this kit uh, 
primarily in our laboratory for these types of methods for our current clients. Um, and we anticipate um, we're getting a lot of requests for this particular uh, method from a lot of our other clients, even that aren't doing um, COVID-19 therapeutics or vaccines at this time, that they have completely unrelated um, therapeutic areas. However, they want to evaluate what the protection um, level is in their enrolled patients so that, again, they can make those types of decisions on whether or not they've had any impact from COVID-19 on their ongoing clinical trial. And then we can probably turn it over for questions. Great, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Ashley. I'm gonna start with, uh, we do have a few questions that came in. Let's see, the first one, uh, Ashley, this one's for you. How many samples per day is, uh, is Eurofins able to, how many samples per day is Eurofins able to run? So with our current setup with um, our, our TCAN EVOs, if they were running at full capacity, we'd probably be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand samples per day if, if we basically converted those over to just doing high throughput for this assay. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, also for Ashley, uh, what types of clinical trials can be used for this test? You know, we're really getting uh, requests for this um, across the board. So we, I don't see a limitation on what types of clinical trials um, or, you know, any other trials that wouldn't necessarily want to evaluate this data um, within their trial package and therefore be able to assess the risk of their patient population in there. If your patients are essentially getting vaccinated and therefore likely dropping some of their guard, um, you'll want to know what the risk truly is for the impact on your clinical trial. Um, if they have a risk of, of getting infected with COVID-19, you really don't want that to muddy the waters of assessing how successful your therapeutic is um, within your trial. Great, thank you. Um, okay, does the um, surrogate assay work in the same way as ELISA? You want me to answer that question? If you would like to, sure. Sean, please, thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's identical. It it works exactly like an ELISA assay. Uh, it's it's It works like, I would say, a fast ELISA assay because the incubation times are much shorter with this test. So you can, you can run qualitatively, uh, you know, uh, the assay in about an hour and a half uh, manually. And again, with uh, with Eurofins automation, they can do they can obviously do much more than that. But but uh, it's just essentially loading samples on a plate, washing the plate, and adding the colorimetric reagent, and looking at the data. So it's very similar to an ELISA. Great, thank you. Okay, Ashley, this one um, is for you. Uh, what are the limitations of this method? So the only limitations I would say uh, to this method, we do have some um, clients that are looking at antibody therapeutics that are specific. So they are looking for that specific response um, to COVID-19. So they need a specific capsid um, level that we're monitoring for them um, for an IgG response or an IgM response. Um, to specific areas of the virus. If that's the case, obviously this doesn't necessarily, um, you know, match that need. But I believe that for any of the assessments for neutralizing antibodies to, to just show that you're, there are active neutralizing antibodies um, in a patient to COVID-19, I don't see that there are very many limitations to it. I think that it is shown to be equivalent to, you know, the gold standard of doing um, live virus testing, um, yet it's much faster. And I think that it's, in my opinion, more reliable um, and straightforward. Um, Sean, go ahead with your opinion on that one as well. Um, I, I agree. I mean, the, and, and the prevailing data published by by other groups that have that have looked at directly comparing uh, CPAS to live virus uh, also supports this. So yes, I agree. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. 
Um, and there were a lot of questions that we did not get a chance to address, but we will get to those questions and get answers for you um, within a couple of days. Um, I would really like to thank our presenters today. Um, and thank you for attend all of you for attending today's webinar. And if you have any other questions and are ready to get started today, please contact us. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would really appreciate if you would help complete that out, provide your feedback. Uh, we'll also be sending a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view uh, a recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Eurofins Bioanalytical Services, and our presenters. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful day.